Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, first thing I like to do, if it's all right with you guys, is go through the crowd, figure out who's a veteran, uh, maybe say something about when you served, what unit you served with, and maybe your favorite place you were stationed or favorite memory of the military. Do uh, you want to start up here? Uh, never in the military. No, sir? Okay. Do you want to say, say hello or anything? Yeah. I'm David Lynch, 20 years U.S. Air Force. Probably my most uh, enjoyable location were two bases in uh, Japan, on the island of Kyushu, same island in Nagasaki is uh, located on Ashia Air Base and Itazuka Air Base. <coughs> Itazuka, during World War II, was actually named Mushiroda. But uh, when the Americans took over, they uh, renamed it Itazuka. All right. Thank you, sir. Anybody down here? Want me to tell you the, my name, sir? Yeah, name, yeah. unit, maybe your favorite place, favorite story. Uh, hi, my name is Randy Moraskowitz. I served from 19, pardon me, 1948 to 1952. Well, two of those years were during the Korean period. I'm a tank driver, and uh, I was a, uh, and prior to going into the military, I'd never driven. But once I got in, I drove everything we had there, <laughs> and every kind of tank that was available at the time. Uh, so that's basically it. We like getting into any big details. There was nothing there. And that was that was the U.S. Army. Yes. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your service. U.S. Army, uh, fifty-six to fifty-eight. During the Cold War, 613th Field Artillery Battalion stationed in Germany for 14 months and uh, played soccer for the seventh hour. <laughs> That's awesome. 59 years with my wife and I haven't won a battle yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the Air Force from 87 to 91 in Great Falls, Montana. Um, I was with the 341st Missile Wing. Okay. I spent all four years there. Okay. All right. Yeah. I got my physical. They told me to go back home. Oh, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> I was 1954 uh, and 56 with the uh, Fourth Field Artillery uh, Pack okay. attached to the 10th Mountain Infantry. And uh, we were on horseback and mules. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, and uh, they're still now, they were in Fort, at Fort Carson and okay. Camp Hale. Now they're at the place in New York. Uh, Fort Jerome. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, the United States Navy uh, served uh, 45 to 46 aboard the USS Morocco, uh, South China Sea, 7th Fleet. All right. Thank you for your service. Behind you, maybe? Yeah. Not a veteran. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Obviously, I'm not a veteran. <laughs> you could be a veteran. No, I doubt it. It's oh. my uh, time frame. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. But I come because of my father and his two brothers, my mother's two brothers, all of whom were in World War II, most of them in combat. Okay. Two family members that I know of, cousins, two family members that I know of who were cousins, one wounded in the South Pacific, one killed at the Battle of the Bulge. All right. Thank you for your service. No, just my family. Thank service. you for your support. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, for everybody, for uh, speaking up. Um, hopefully, you know, I, I don't like to talk at people, and I don't like to read a lot of words. I hate PowerPoints where there's a lot. So this will be a lot of pictures and just a lot of stories. And then we'll get into like some, some serious stuff in a little bit. But most of this will be pretty loose. And if you see something you recognize, you know, holler out. Um, I graduated from Stronzo High School in 1988. I was a pretty bad kid. My mom's here, and she'll tell you. Uh, barely graduated, <laughs> in, in and out of trouble. So I joined the Marines as soon as I turned 18 and uh, shipped out. Went to Paris Island, South Carolina. Any jarheads in the room? Am I the only jarhead? Oh, that's scary. All right. <laughs> so uh, I had a DI. That's, that was not my DI. 
Uh, that guy was not my DI either. Those guys were my DIs. And they were, I still have nightmares about Sergeant Jordan. Uh, he was a scary dude. This is me down here. Uh, and I'm still friends with a couple of these guys on Facebook and we chat from time to time, good guys. I remember one time in the middle of the night in boot camp, I was in my bunk and I was reading a letter from home after lights out. You're not supposed to be reading letters after lights out, you're supposed to be asleep. And I had the blanket up over my head and I was reading the letter and I could feel the temperature in the room get colder. And I knew something was going on. I pulled the blanket down, I looked over and Sergeant Jordan's smoky hat came rising up and a big smile on his face. He was so happy, he took my whole bed and just flipped it. <laughs> big steel bunk beds and woke up the whole platoon and we all got in trouble, it was horrible. Um, this is my dad, he came down, uh, my mom and sister came down too when I graduated from Paris Island. My dad was a Marine too, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. How many people here who served in the military came from military families? Like I know my dad was in, anybody else's parents serve or brothers, sisters? Uncles, no, okay, all right. Yeah, so, so in my family, I grew up with a Marine dad, so I was kind of predestined to join the Marines. Um, after I graduated boot camp, I went to Marine combat training down at Camp Geiger, uh, the School of Infantry at Camp Geiger. During the School of Infantry, different units would come in and interview Marines to see if they wanted to try out for different things. So you could try out for sniper, uh, you could try out for recon, I tried out for a Marine security guard. So I ended up getting picked and sent to a school in California. And on the USS Enterprise, uh, me and a small team, a Marine detachment, we guarded all the nukes on the carrier. Um, so I was on the Enterprise, uh, not that USS Enterprise, uh, that USS Enterprise, also known as the Big E. Um, and I, I was lucky enough, uh, this was in 89, when I was on the carrier, we made a world cruise. So I went all the way around the world, crossed the equator, Went from being a tadpole to a shellback, had the whole ceremony out at sea, and uh, had a good time. There were 75 Marines and 5,000 Navy guys, so we fought a lot. <laughs> they, the Navy hated us, we hated them, and uh, it, was, it was interesting. Uh, this is one of my best friends, Max. Uh, still good friends with him. He lives down in Tennessee, works at a Honda plant, working on uh, engines. This is when we were first stationed um, on the aircraft carrier. Uh, later, we were both on the Roosevelt uh, during the Gulf War, and we were training with Navy SEALs to take down ships that were trying to break the embargo, right? The U.S. had put an embargo up, and uh, we didn't want to let anybody get through. So I was the rope team commander. I'd kick out a fast rope. The guys would slide down the rope onto the boat and, and take down the bad guys. Well, while we were training, we realized what happens if our small team of Marines gets overwhelmed and there's too many bad guys for us. One of our options was just to jump overboard, let the bad guys keep going, we'll figure it out later, and then I'd come through with the helicopter and scoop everybody up. So Max came to my, my rack that night and said, hey, I can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> this, this kid's in the Marines in the middle of the Gulf and he can't swim. He's a good shot, so the Marines pushed him through, but he couldn't swim, so he was scared. You know, he, like, We gotta jump overboard, man, I'm gonna drown. So uh, the Navy guys, you guys remember, we have Mae West, right? It's like a little pouch you put on and it's got a, a inflatable life jacket in it. You know, some of them have little blow tubes. The new ones have a little CO2 cartridge. So we went into a Navy berthing and we stole some Navy guys, Mae West, and we took it back to our berthing and we cut off the belt and we cut, there's like shark dye, we cut that off. There's a little strobe light, we cut that off. We are just like a big pile of gear around us. Um, there was a movie with Tom Hanks where he was an uh, astronaut and he got, I forget, Apollo 13 or something. That's how we felt. We were just in the middle of the night, in the middle of the Gulf, in the middle of a ship trying to figure out how to keep Max alive. And uh, we ended up rigging up this, this bulletproof vest underneath him. or We put this inflatable thing under his bulletproof vest, put all his gear on, and I was like, all right, so, so pop it. Let's see if it works. And he couldn't get his arm underneath to the CO2 cartridge. So we took a 550 cord, like parachute cord, and rigged up a little handle for him. So then he could reach down, pop it, and it would swell up. And that way, if he took bullets, he'd be okay because the vest was underneath. Uh, so the problem is those things are one use only, right? So we had to throw that one overboard and go steal another one, <laughs> and then cut all the stuff off again and rig it all up. So for the whole war, Max wore that thing underneath his, his vest. It was ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it's just like we're like two kids like trying to figure out how to stay alive. I mean, the, the military just puts you in crazy situations. That's me and Max on duty in Hong Kong. 
Um, we were the Marine Guards, like I said, on the, sh on the aircraft carrier. That was one of the fun things about my job. I ended up you know, on the flight deck of a carrier, jets. Like people go to the air show, right? We just had the air show in Cleveland. People pay big bucks to climb around airplanes and I had this stuff all around me every day. You know, F-14s, F-16s, A-2s, A-7s, A-6s, everything, helicopters. It was fun. If you're, you know, 19-year-old kid, that's a good time. At least it was for me. Like I said, I was kind of crazy, though. Um, this is our living room on the ship. So I always show this to people. Like, military folks, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of military people, a lot of veterans like guns, right? This was my living room. This is where I watched TV for two years. Shotguns on the left, M16s in front, bulletproof vests, helmets. If an alarm went off on the ship, we'd grab some gear, grab some ammo, and go figure out what was going on. You know, we were just running all over the boat looking for bad guys. Um, and so we, we just grew up, you know. Uh, this kid's on duty right now. He's got a 45 in that holster. You know, it's way back in the day. Um, and this is his vest in case he's got to react and, and go anyplace. He'll throw his vest on, grab a shotgun, and go running. So... I don't know, just, we, we have like, military people have a different history with weapons, I think, than a lot of civilians do. This is me in my bunk. Um, so three high, right, on the, on the carriers in the birthings. Uh, this was, I don't know, probably like 90, 91. And the, the, I was smoking at, the point, at that point, and you could smoke right in your rack. Like anywhere on the boat you could smoke, in your birthing, in your bed. Like we all had like cans we just put our cigarettes out in. It was nuts, you know, <laughs> just... I don't know, but this, I, I like this because you can see, like, you know, I'm Hispanic, Morel is a big white kid from Maine, Palmer, you know, a black kid from Texas, like, and we're all, like, right there, you know, kind of forced desegregation and people getting along and multicultural diversity, you know, you had to get over all that stuff real fast in a tight space, you know, that's why a lot of people say band of brothers, you know, that people throw that phrase around a lot, you end up getting real tight with those folks because it's tight quarters. So one of the weird things on the Enterprise is they uh, had a 22-hour chili bar, right? So sometimes this dude who slept in this rack would get a little too excited about the chili. <laughs> and we would have to don and clear, right? We'd have to put our gas mask on because this dude was super funky. And that space would get really just musty. I don't know why they had a chili bar, 22-hour chili bar on the ship. I don't know who thought of that. Like a salad bar maybe, but a chili bar? I don't know. One of the jobs we had, too, was just if there's a, a small boat or a low, slow flyer, we had to repel any kind of borders. So all of us were trained up on the 50 cals. So that was always fun. Uh, we had spots all around the carrier with 50 cals. And uh, above us, they have R2-D2 units. It's like a big, looks like R2-D2. It's got a Gatling gun on it. And if anything comes in fast, rockets or fast flyers, they'll, they'll take those out. We were just for like the smaller, slower boats. But that was always a good time. Uh, this is me, Zengel, and Max on the Enterprise, uh, M16s, and then Max has got an M16 with a grenade launcher underneath it. That was my favorite weapon to carry. Zengel was from New Jersey. <laughs> Good kid. So out at sea, there's no place to run, right? There's no place to, to, to do physical fitness training. You can run around the carrier, but it's 17 laps around the carrier for one mile, and the carrier's rocking and rolling. So you're, you're you know, trying to not fall off the thing while you do 17 laps. You couldn't even keep track of how many laps you did. So sometimes in the Marines down in our building, we would just clear everything out, get in a circle, and we would just fight each other. And you had to fight each other by weight class, right? So it was just, and we had like a cup, headgear, and a mouthpiece, and that was it. Every, everything else, it was free. If you wrestled, if you did karate, if you were street fighter, it was on. Zengel was a black belt in Kempo Karate. He kicked, he kicked all our butts. <laughs> he, was, he was great. I remember he kicked one kid right in the chest. He flew back like straight like in the movies, like eight feet. Just Now, this is my dad. So uh, one of the cool things, I don't even know if they still do this or not, but back in the day, they used to do tiger cruises. So at the end of our six-month pump, my dad flew down to Fort Lauderdale with all the other fathers, brothers, sons, grandfathers, all the male members. Uh, family members, and he got on the boat and he rode with me from Fort Lauderdale up to Norfolk, Virginia. So for four days, uh, he shared my rack. So when I was on duty, he could sleep. When I was off duty, I'd kick him out and I'd jump in the rack and get some sleep. But uh, he was down in the Marine Detachment. All the other fathers were down in the Marine Detachment. Everybody smoking, playing poker, hanging out for four days. And it was really cool. So he was a Marine, like I said, and it was super funny to see him on ship because he would just 
push his way through the Navy guys. <laughs> you know, just like, never, never let it go. Um, and they would just hang out, you know, and we would do air shows. And the air shows we did, I'm spoiled, because the air shows we did out at sea, we would drop live ordnance on targets. F-14s would come through and strafe targets. We'd drop Navy frogmen into the sea. Uh, we'd let everybody shoot our rifles over, you know, the, over the, the back end of the boat. The, the air shows that we, we put down were crazy. So now I go to the air show, I'm like, all right, when do they start bombing stuff? <laughs> do they, they, don't, they don't bomb anything? This is a boring air show. Oh, and one more story about um, just being on ship with these guys, too. So, just like trying to keep Max alive, one time I was on duty and, and we were stationed in San Fran on the Enterprise, about to go on our world cruise, and uh, I was uh, the corporal of the guard on duty, and some Navy guys came down and said, hey, are you guys ready to go? And I was like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. They're like, we need some Marines to go into town with us and get the money. It's like, I have no idea. Go talk to your sergeant. So I woke up Sergeant Smith, and I was like, hey, these guys want us to go get some money? Oh yeah, we're supposed to send a small marine detachment with uh, some Navy guys to the bank. Just grab like three of your buddies. <laughs> so I was like, all right. So I grabbed Max and, and Tony and Chris, like a couple of my other buddies, and I was like, hey, we got some crazy mission. We're supposed to go with the Navy into town and uh, escort some money back. And they're like, well, can we take weapons? <laughs> right, so I'm in charge, I'm 19. I was like, sure, let's go to the armory and grab some weapons. So uh, the one kid was like, can I take a shotgun? Yeah, sure, take a shotgun, you know, grab a shotgun, load it up. Can I take a pistol? Yeah, sure, I, I, take whatever you want, I don't care. Can I take one of those holsters, like a cross, like a tanker? I was like, if we have those, just take it. I don't, we came out of there, it was like bandoliers of shotgun ammo, pistols, rifles, M16s, loaded up. We, we got in the back of this van and rode into San Francisco, walked right through the bank, fully armed, down an elevator into this vault, and they had a pallet of money that they loaded up into the Navy van. It was $1.6 million in cash, just shrink-wrapped. And it's me and three of my buddies in the back of a van, right? So Max is sitting, he's got the, he's got the seat behind the driver, and then I got the seat in the back. And I'm looking out the window, like, did you guys see the movie Heat? Right, you know that like gunfight that they have in the street? Like, I'm thinking something like this, and this is even before Heat came out, I was worried about Heat. Like, I, I was worried I was gonna be Heat, right? So I'm in the van, and I'm looking out the windows for bad guys. You know, it's just a plain Navy van. Nobody even knows there's, you know, almost $2 million in there. I look up, and, and Max has got his pistol out, pointed at the back of the van, back of the driver. And he's like, <laughs> like, looks at the money. He's like, what do you think? And I, I like, looked at the money, and I did the math real fast. Like, if we were in, in LA, close to the Mexican border, maybe. But we were in San Fran, that's a long run, man. I'm like, I, I'm like no. And he was like, all right. And like, just put his, we just holstered it. Like, we should not be on this mission. Like, me and my buddy should not be doing this stuff. But yeah, it's just like, you grow up fast and you just do crazy stuff. So I tell people a lot of times, when you come out of the military, I feel like that's an advantage in the civilian world because like, most civilians don't have the experiences that we do. Right, just in the middle of the day, I just put a team together and we figured this stuff out and we did some crazy stuff. So now when I'm at a company and they say, hey, do you think you can manage this project? Yeah, of course I can manage that. Pro I did this crazy stuff, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Let's get back. So then I ended up in uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I was on the USS Theodore Roosevelt, also known as the Big Stick. Um, that was a good time. So for me, this was like the best case scenario for going to the Gulf War, right? I wasn't in the sand. I had a hot shower every day. I had hot meals every day, but I still served during the Gulf War, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Provide Comfort and all that stuff. All the ribbons, medals, all the happy stuff, but I was safe. Never had to hurt nobody. Brought all my guys home. Like I, I had a good Persian Gulf War experience. Uh, this is me. Like I said, I was a rope team commander. So me and the other rope team commander just practicing after the war, keeping our skills up, uh, making sure that in case something happened, we could respond to it. Uh, after, the, uh, after the sea duty, two years of that, I went back home to Camp Lejeune, where I went back to my real job, which was infantry. Uh, that was my primary MOS, was 0311, if anybody's familiar with that. First Battalion, six Marines is who I ended up with. Uh, so there's all kinds of different units, 22, 24, 38, 36. Most of the even numbers are on the East Coast odd numbers on the west coast at Camp Pendleton, and then 3rd Division is out in Okinawa. So the funny thing about 1st Battalion 6 Marines is 20 years prior, my dad would happen to be with 1st Battalion 6 Marines. Just totally randomly, 
my dad and I had ended up in the same units, right? So during the Battle of Bellow Woods in World War II, Marine, 5th and 6th Marine regiments fought and defended France and fought against the Germans. And the Germans nicknamed us Tufelhunden. We fought like devil dogs, right? So that's where the phrase devil dogs comes from. So we earned during that battle a French forager that only the 5th and the 6th Marine regiments can wear. So me and my dad both ended up with 6th Marine regiments and both were able to wear that forager for a little while. So it was cool. It was funny. I ended up in the same barracks, um, same scratchy blankets, same horrible, uncomfortable racks, same exact locker. 20 years later, same, I probably had the same blanket he had. It was, you know, the old government issue garbage. But uh, yeah, it's crazy. Just totally coincidence. Um, this is me and Max in the, in the 29 Palms doing desert training. So of course, the way the Marine Corps does things, right, is after you go to the Persian Gulf, then they send you to, to desert training. <laughs> right, so that's what happened to us. And of course, we're in our woodland fatigues out in the desert. Yeah, I don't, you know, Marine Corps is crazy. Um, now they wear desert, you know, camis. They have tan camis. This is me and my squad doing some training out in uh, 29 Palms. Um, it was a good time. I got a couple fire teams. Uh, this guy's name is, uh, so I was the corporal, the squad leader. This is Lance Corporal Potter. He was my first fire team leader. We were in the back of a five ton coming back from an exercise out in the desert. And uh, Potter and I are standing up in the back of the truck and we got our rifles out. No bayonets, but our rifles. And we're hooking and jabbing like we're bayonet fighting. And the truck hit a bump and his rifle barrel went into my mouth. And I, I was like, hold on, hold on. And I started spitting out pieces of like blood and broken tooth. My whole squad went nuts. They thought that was the funniest thing they ever seen. <laughs> Potter thought he was like gonna get court-martialed. We didn't care, like we're all fighters, who cares? So they just put a plug in my tooth and I just, you know, they pulled all the pieces out, put like some silly putty up there or something, and we just kept it rocking. So it was, so these are some of the challenges facing veterans today. Um, and we'll talk, you know, this gets better as it goes. Um, obviously PTSD is, is a real thing, right? We got a lot of kids coming home from Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, kids who have done multiple tours too, right? So there's so few kids serving right now, they have to go back two, three, four, or five times. You know, I saw that uh, Navy SEAL in the news recently who was accused of doing a bunch of bad stuff. He had done five combat tours. You, you don't come back from five combat tours the way you left, you know? So, so there's a lot of PTSD. What we do talk about with PTSD is instead of seeing military veteran people as broken or damaged, right? So somebody who has cancer and beats cancer are seen as a survivor. They can come back stronger through the experience, right? We feel the same way about our, our soldiers, our Marines, our sailors. Just because they've been through some stuff doesn't mean they're broken. They can come back and be stronger, actually. So we call that post-traumatic growth. There can, there can be growth after you've gone through some tough stuff where you can be stronger because of the things you've gone through, right? So, and that's, that's the stuff I try to focus on with the kids that I help at Tri-C. Um, TBI, traumatic brain injury, is a real thing, right? You have a lot of IEDs. You have kids shooting rockets over their shoulders, and it just, you know, jars their brain over and over. Um, suicide, uh, the new stats, this is down to 18 per day now, which is good, it's dropping down, but it's still way too many uh, people taking their own lives. If, if you have PTSD and it's untreated, it can lead obviously to drug or alcohol addiction, which obviously can lead to criminal justice, right? Cuyahoga County um, has set up a court for veterans, so they look at all this stuff, right? Was the crime that this veteran committed related back to his service? untreated PTSD, addiction, and crime. So we're trying to break that up and look at it. Um, Department of Defense is looking at now reinstating some people who got dishonorable discharge, bad conduct discharge because of their PTSD. Maybe they flipped out and punched their commanding officer, but they're not bad guys, they just had PTSD. So let's look at those discharges and see if we can change the discharges and make those guys eligible for healthcare, right? Because some these guys just need help. Um, and we gotta take care of our own. Homelessness. Tons of veterans are homeless, you know, way, way too many uh, veterans are out on the street. The VA is in the news all the time, right? They, they just, uh, too many veterans can't get help. I don't know if you've seen recently, they, the federal government has started to make some changes now where VA, where veterans can use uh, urgent care for some smaller stuff. So that's nice. Uh, I know my chiropractor, I, I signed up and they, you know, I had x-rays done at the VA and they said, yeah, your back's definitely mess, messed up because the Marine Corps, you know, will authorize chiropractic care. I went down to Stokes. And the chiropractor I saw said, hey, I'm triple booked. Is there somebody like in your neighborhood you can go see? So I do, I see a guy in my neighborhood and the VA pays for it. So the VA is getting better about taking care of people locally and in their neighborhoods. 
Um, but it, there's still way too many guys that have service-connected injuries that aren't getting taken care of. And women of war, you know, the, the, there's not a whole lot of females in the military, but they have a pretty tough time with uh, military sexual trauma, uh, trauma committed more often by their own people than by the enemy. So that's still a huge issue, and the VA is getting better at serving those folks. And there's now uh, women's health care divisions within each VA hospital that treat them, and it's usually all women staff that help out the women veterans. Uh, changes, uh, so some of the kids that are coming out of the military, you know, it's challenges for them because the military culture that we were on, you know, if you were active duty living on a base, the culture there is very different from the civilian world. Uh, I had a really hard time when I came home with that integrity. For me, if I told somebody I'll meet you at the bar at six o'clock, I was there at 545, right? And, and you were there at least by six. Uh, civilians don't go with that same time frame, <laughs> you know? And it took me a real long time and a lot, a lot of conversations to get over that and to realize that like now I have to go with six-ish. You know, I have to expect people will be there around six o'clock. If somebody says six, they're, they're probably not gonna be there at six, probably six-ish. So that's, that's helped out. But it's hard for us military guys because if you're not there at six, the plane leaves without you, the boat leaves without you, they blow the bridge. You know, for us, time is serious. For civilians, not so serious. Uh, same thing with discipline. You know, just like people, I worked at Pakatan's warehouse when I first got out, just, you know, working at a warehouse. And I was shocked at just the discipline of civilians in this warehouse. It was like, it hurt my head. Like just people trying to get over, taking naps, stealing stuff. It, it, like we would never do that, you know. So it was really hard. And there's a lot, a lot of guys that have a hard time. Decisiveness, you know, still like where every, every company I worked at, people would come to me and ask me like, hey, what do you think? Should I do this or this? I was like, I'm, I'm way down here. I don't ask somebody up here. But the people up there weren't always comfortable making decisions. And they'd push and hem and haw and cover their own butts. I, I feel like a lot of military people, we're not afraid to make a decision. You know, we, we weigh it and say, yeah, let's go with this. And we'll take responsibility for it if it goes right or goes wrong. Um, Act versus think, this is a hard one when um, veterans come home and they go to college, right? In the military, we're all action. We're trained, we practice it over and over, we know how to clear a house without even thinking about it. Who's going through the door first, check the corners. We, we practice that stuff. We don't think really, we're just muscle memory moving through spaces. Now you have people that have to sit in a chair and they just have to listen to people talk at them and they just have to use their brains and not move. And it's hard for a lot of kids coming home just to sit in there and, and just listen and, and not, not act. World travel and witness to events, the same things. At, at, so I work at Kyle Community College, right? That's what my job is. I work for the Veterans Initiative and I help veterans on the campus. So in the state of Ohio, we have a program called College Credit Plus. It's an awesome program so kids in high school can take college classes. So we've had kids that graduate high school and graduate college in the same month. They have their two-year degree already, and they grab their high school diploma at the same time. I think that's a cool program. Some kids are super, you know, uh, super smart. But the state of Ohio has dropped that down to anybody 12 years and up can attend college classes. So you might have a 22, 23-year-old Marine veteran who's done two combat tours sitting next to a 12-year-old in a psych class. It's, sometimes it's a little hard to connect, you know. So, so there's, there's, there's some real challenges that, that these guys go through coming home and trying to transition back to, back to the civilian world. Veteran unemployment, same thing. Um, for veterans, two times the national average, especially infantry, right? It's, it's, infantry guys have a tough time. Um, some of that is due to cultural polarization. Currently, 1% of the U.S. population serves in the military. It's a very small percentage of people actually serving in the military. Veteran, it goes five, six, seven percent of our country are veterans. So we have a lot of veterans in here that we're, you know, we're, we're above the average. Um, but there's not a lot of people that are serving in the military or have served in the military. So that, that makes it hard sometimes for guys coming home. Skills translation, sometimes people don't know how to talk about what they did in the military to like a civilian higher, uh, uh, HR team. Uh, I was an infantry squad leader. You know, so I took care of my squad. Well, what does that mean? Well, I had 12 guys underneath me, and I made sure they were trained, fed, clothed, housed. Uh, I was HR. I was their boss. I was their trainer. I did everything for those guys. And sometimes people don't know how to talk about that stuff. And marketing. Sometimes we don't know how to market ourselves either. You know, a lot of military guys are very humble. We went in, we did what we did, and now we're ready to move on. So now you're in an interview, and you have to talk about all the amazing things you did. Sometimes we have a hard time selling ourselves.
So, you know, that, that, that actually hurts us. The new, the new VA secretary is trying to fix a lot of things within the VA. Like I said, there are backlogs, there are veterans that aren't getting service. Uh, the forever GI Bill uh, fixed some things and messed some things up. So uh, a lot of you guys that were in here probably had the Montgomery GI Bill, right? You probably paid into it and you probably had like 10 years to use the GI Bill if you wanted to go to college. Uh, the post 9-11 guys had 15 years to use their benefits. Still, still only 36 months, but you had 15 years to use it. The forever GI Bill, if somebody gets out today, they can use their college 36 months of benefits for the rest of their lives. So, so if they got out and they got a job working at Ford, working on the line, and they did that for 30 years, retired, and said, you know what, I think I want to go to school for computers, their GI Bill would still be sitting there waiting for them. So I, I think that's a great change because I think every veteran that serves, there should be a time limit on when they go to college. That, that free college should be there. Um, so that I'm, I'm super happy about that. Um, and then, like I said, we're working on changing mental health coverage so we can catch those guys that got other than honorable discharges and get them the help they need. Uh, there's a lot of those guys out there that, that you know, need help. House Bill 488 uh, affects me directly because it uh, requires colleges in the state of Ohio that take the GI Bill, right? The GI Bill is a very lucrative uh, school paying system. So if you take that money, you have to have staff at your college to help the veterans at your college. So that's me, right? So that's, that's, this is how I'm working at Tri-C is because of House Bill 488. Uh, so that we have a certifying officer that handles all the GI Bill paperwork. And then I sit down with the veterans and make sure they understand the enrollment process, registration, how to submit paperwork for their GI Bill. And then I also talk to them about to make sure that they're tied into the VA healthcare. They have a doctor. If they need mental health, they have a shrink. And I talk to all the guys like, look, I was in the Persian Gulf War. I, I use the Parma CBOC. I don't know if any of the veterans in here use the VA healthcare, but I use the one on Brook Park Road right across from the Golden Corral. My doctor is Dr. True and my shrink is Kevin McCutcheon. They're both good doctors. If anybody needs a doctor or a shrink, I'll introduce you tomorrow to them. They're good guys. Um, so, and I do that with all my kids. Everybody I talk to, I make sure that they know that that help is there. I don't want anybody alone trying to deal with PTSD or any of this stuff by themselves. I want them to know that I'm there and there's good doctors there. Um, and college credit for the military training, that's getting better and better. So now if somebody was an MP in the Army and they want to be a cop, there's a lot of translation of their military training over to a college credit towards that police academy certificate or towards a degree in criminal justice. Same thing with nurses and mechanics, electrical engineers, all that stuff. We're working more closely with college accrediting agents to make sure all those credits transfer. And then locally, I don't know if you guys heard about the Fisher House, but uh, in Cleveland, we just recently built actually two Fisher Houses. So a Fisher House is almost like a Ronald McDonald House, but it's for veteran families. So if somebody was coming up from uh, Dayton, Ohio, and they needed an operation and their wife and kids were with them and they were going to be here for the weekend, the whole family could stay at the Fisher House for free. It's communal. So there's a big open kitchen, fridge, microwaves, you know, they, everybody can cook, all kinds of, you know, chill out rec rooms, um, little courtyard people can hang out, and it's all free for the families and it's beautiful. So it, it's really, it's nice. So that's, that just opened up a couple months ago. There are tons of veteran organizations that serve veterans in Northeast Ohio. NeoVets is one of them, and NeoVets is really focused on helping employers find veterans to hire and understanding how that process works and getting them the right uh, candidates for open jobs that they have. And then CBOC, that's a community-based outpatient clinic. Like I said, uh, did anybody ever go to the Brexville uh, VA? I know some folks used to go to Brexville. Uh, Parma's the CBOC that I go to, um, but it's just a smaller outpatient only VA hospital. Uh, so post 9-11, like I said, the, the, the new GI Bill is amazing. Uh, it pays for public school 100%. So if kids want to go to Tri-C, Cleveland State, 100% of their school is paid for. Um, it also gives them uh, money for books, $1,000 a year for books, and it also gives them housing pay, BAH, which right now, if somebody from Medina was in school, that'd be $1,200 a month just direct deposited into their account. So school's paid for, books are paid for, and they're getting housing pay. And that gives the veteran time to focus on school. If they want to do a part-time job, some of our guys are Uber, some of our guys work at Aldi's or have work for their families part-time, but really the, the GI Bill pays. Um, and everything goes right from the VA right to the college. The kids don't even have to worry about it as long as they have the GI Bill uh, and books and supplies. Yeah, oh, in the Yellow Ribbon School, so some of the, the private schools have agreed with the VA to uh, split the cost 
So like BW is like 40,000 a year or something. So the, uh, the veteran couldn't afford that. So BW takes the GI Bill and says, okay, we'll throw in some, the VA will throw in some, and the kids can go to school here for free too. So as long as a veteran can get into BW, they can go there for free also. So it's, it's like I said, it's nice to see the support. Um, so so if, if veterans are out there and they need help, where can you direct them? Uh, like I said, the VA hospitals, the ones in Northeast Ohio are really good. The ones out west are horrible, right? They're, they're, they're understaffed, they're overwhelmed, they don't have enough mental health people, uh, people are, are, are killing themselves all over the place, people are not receiving treatment that they need and they're just dying. So Northeast Ohio, we have really good uh, health care with the VA especially, so those are good. Um, and the Medina County Veterans Service Commission in Medina has a shuttle that will run people back and forth from their office to either Parma or Stokes. So if people ever did want to use the VA, there's a shuttle that you can sign up for and it'll take you back and forth. Uh, there's tons of uh, VA benefits people are eligible for. I'm working with my dad right now to fill out, uh, you know, the VA is funny. Um, they want you to get pre-approved for the cemeteries now, <laughs> right? So sure, that's fine. I already filled mine out, you know, uh, and I'm working with my dad to fill his out right now. So there's a form you fill out, DD-214, you mail it in, and uh, they'll, let, they'll let you like pick out your headstone and what you want it to say, and if you want like years of service and, you know. So I like that. Uh, it's just me and my little sister, and I wasn't always the best big brother. So I don't know what she's gonna put on my headstone. So I'm gonna fill that out first. I have that figured out <laughs> before, before I go. Um, so so that, that option is there, but people can help you, you know, fill that out if you're interested in that. And, the, and the, so the one closest here is Rittman. I don't know if people have been down to Rittman to check that out. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful place. I got a couple friends that are buried out there. And uh, one of our students from Tri-C is buried out there. Ryan Wheeler is a good kid. But uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, the veteran and their spouse can get buried together in there too. And a lot of people didn't know that. Uh, whoever goes first goes into the ground first or ashes and then the other one can join them later, so that's nice. Um, but uh, Ed Zachary at the Medina County Veteran Service Commission, does everybody know Ed Zachary? He's a, yeah, he's a good guy, he runs a good shop in Medina, and he can help people with any kind of paperwork that they need, whether it's VA health care, filing for disability benefits, or filling out the cemetery paperwork, any of that stuff. And then, you know, I'm with Tri-C, so I gotta push Tri-C, right? At every Tri-C campus, we have a guy like me, a veteran on the campus that meets with other veterans. So I'm a Marine vet at the West Campus in Parma. Matt Miller was Army Artillery out at East. Elena Foster was in the Air Force uh, downtown. Uh, Joni, uh, Joan Sweeney Dent is a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the National Guard. And then my boss is Rick Deshant. He's a retired Lieutenant Commander from the Coast Guard. So all of us on all the campuses are all prior service. So that's good because a lot of kids come in and they come in with their GI Bill and they're afraid somebody's going to rip them off. Once they find out we're military too, you know, they relax a lot. Uh, how can you help? Um, if you want to help out vets, you know, you can volunteer at the VA hospital. Um, they're always looking for volunteers, people to push folks around in wheelchairs or come to uh, functions or we have homeless stand downs where we pass out gear. Sometimes we just do hot dogs with veterans at uh, Stokes and, you know, hang out with guys. Um, the USO still exists and does things. They have scholarships for kids. Those are great. Uh, support local veterans. Like I said, Fisher House, uh, American Legions, VFWs. Uh, those are still around and still do good work. Uh, I helped out a guy at the Valley City VFW. He's a good dude. Um, and then there's new programs too. Team Red, White, and Blue is a, it's a bunch of young veterans that get together and they go on runs, 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons. They bike, hike, and kayak and stuff. So they, they help military folks reintegrate into the community all through exercise. So it's not like you're sitting around in a circle talking about PTSD, you're just out on a run. And if stuff comes up, you talk about it. If not, then you're just out on a run. So that's a good group. And then the Mission Continues is a group of, of veterans that do like nonprofit work. They build playgrounds, they clear trails for the park, um, they're doing a thing for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Cleveland. So like if you wanna get, give back and hang out with other vets, it's, it's a good organization to join up and check on a vet. We do buddy check Wednesdays. You know, every Wednesday, I reach out to a few veterans and just make sure they're okay. You know, make sure somebody's checking on them. They're good. You know, they, they, don't, they don't need anything. Uh, this is just, uh, if you do enough stuff for the library, they end up doing crazy stuff like this. So, so when I was a bad kid, I actually ran away from home. So th this was funny. I saw this truck go by. I had like a little flashback. Like what the, it was like I was on a milk carton again. Um, so they had me on the side of a library truck for a little while. It was funny.
This is another uh, library program you can check out, different people telling their stories. And this is a funny, this is my last picture, my last slide. Uh, funny story, this is all of us, uh, me and one of my teams in Hong Kong. Uh, I think I was 19. And I just like this because it's diversity and it's uh, multicultural. Uh, the top left is your Queda and his buddy Fofana. They're both Mexican gangbangers, just tough kids uh, from Texas. Morel is from Maine, right, northeast. I'm from Ohio. Max is from Tennessee. And Palmer uh, was a guitar player from Texas. And, uh, you know, all of us were best friends, had each other's backs. Like I said, band of brothers. And that's just us all being silly, you know. Uh, if we needed to fight, we could fight. But sometimes you just got to have a beer and relax. There's all kinds of uh, Tri-C propaganda over here. My card's over there. There's stuff about the Brunswick University Center. There's a Tri-C campus in Brunswick. Um, so if people want to uh, grab any information over there, there's like uh, little bags and stuff people can grab too. Uh, thank you. So uh, do we have any questions, any comments from the crowd? Any, any pictures stir up anything? Yes, sir. Yeah, here, take the mic. Connected to uh, exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, since you circulate with the military and, and active and veterans, pertaining to current events, um, there's this thing going on now. They're trying to have talks with the Taliban. What the, what's the general feeling amongst veterans about all that? Yeah, so I, I, I don't even know. Like, I won't even comment on that, you know, um, because that just happened, like, this week, right? Yeah, yeah. So until, until, like, I get the guys together and we start talking, yeah, we won't know. Um, I, I assume a lot of them wouldn't be very happy about that, especially, like, I'm at Camp David. A lot of folks would be happy about that. But yeah, until, until I get them all together and we start trading, it'll, it'll come up though. And, and we try to stay away from politics, but politics ends up coming up, you know. Politics, religion, that stuff, especially vets, race, all that stuff comes up. It's, you know. Are you a government employee? No, sir. No, I, I work for, well, I, I work for the college. So I work for Cuyahoga <laughs> Community College, which I, I guess ultimately is state funded. So I, like my pension is through OPERS, you know. So, so I don't know, I guess indirectly I'm a state employee but I would consider myself that I work for the college. Yeah, yeah I, I don't work for the VA. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You don't work for the VA? No, sir, no. I, I work for the Veterans Initiative, like a department that serves veterans on the campus, but I really work for the college. Yeah, so Cleveland State does have a veteran affairs worker embedded in their uh, student veterans program. So they're called the Viking Vets, and they have a guy that works for the federal VA that has an office on campus in their veterans office and he can help people file claims and do disability claims and help with the GI Bill. We, we don't have that at Tri-C, yeah. Yeah, any other questions or, yes ma'am? You're gonna think this is silly, sorry. <laughs> that uh. scratchy, ugly blanket that yeah. you had. <laughs> Here, let me, let me. That scratchy, ugly blanket that you had. Yes ma'am. Was it wool? <laughs> sure was. We're kids, that's what you chose. No, the reason I ask is my yeah. father came home with two of them. Those things <laughs> never die. <laughs> yeah, they were wool. Um, yeah, they were probably like originally like 12 feet by 12 feet, and then they shrink up to like four by six, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, ours had uh, the ones that my dad brought home from the Marines had like the U.S. stencil on them. I don't know if yours had that too. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, super itchy, and, but you're right, they never die. And then the other thing we always carried too, I don't know if other branches had, was our whoobie, right? So it's like a, a poncho liner, like a silky kind of blanket. It's a, it might be a marine thing, I don't know. Oh yeah, we loved our whoobies. Like that was like our blankies, we carried them. <laughs> like you see a bunch of like, like psycho jarheads and we have our whoobies with us, it was always. So a lot of guys still have those, yeah. And any other, yes sir, yeah. You mentioned when you were on the uh, Enterprise that the Marines and Navy didn't like each other and they got into it. In my 20 years in the Air Force, I never experienced that with other branches of the service and even foreign armed forces that we worked with. I never saw that animosity between various elements. Yeah. Why does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's a good question. And I, I'll only talk about my own experience, yeah. right? I, I can't talk about the whole Marine Corps. I know for my units, we were infantry units, or on the ship, we were security units, right? So we were trained for combat, and we were trained for battle. And we liked to fight, and, and so we fought. 
a lot. And if we didn't have like bad guy enemy to fight, we would mostly fight the Navy, right? Because they were just around. And then if the Navy wasn't around, if we were just like stuck on base, we would just fight each other. Like we were just fighters, right? So that's cool that like you, uh, you did Intel, right? Well, Intel, but I was uh, Air Police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a number of years as well. So yeah, so you were police. You probably, you had way more decorum than we had. We, 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 we were fighters, and we just fought everybody all the time. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's sane. I'm not saying it's healthy. It's just how we were, and, and we, we fought a lot, and each other, and everybody all the time. We, so, so, so when I was in, I was in 88 to 92, there were still guys in my unit where a judge said, you either have to join the service or go to prison, right? So I had some scary dudes in my unit that should have been incarcerated for some serious felonies. But instead, they were in my squad. So those guys love to fight. And, and that's just who we were, you know, the Marine Corps first to fight, you know, we, we were fighters. So that's good that you didn't experience that, and that's awesome, and you know, that's, that was not my experience. <laughs> yeah, you did, for sure, for sure. And, and you know, all, a lot of us, most of us, mellow over time, right? 18 to 22, we're bulletproof, We'll fight anybody, we'll take on anybody. As you get older, like, you know, you fight less and less and less. Like, I haven't been in a fight in, you know, 20 years or something, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully for that little brief amount of time, <laughs> we were knuckleheads, but we grew out of it. <laughs> yeah. Any, anybody else? Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah. Are you, are you still getting a pipeline of volunteers? Are you not having any trouble still getting? Volunteers yeah. The yeah, 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 that's a good question. Yeah, so, so there's, uh, I feel like the, the, under Trump, right, he's trying to pull people back um, and, and get us out of places and reduce uh, the number of um, troops we have, especially Iraq and Afghanistan, right? He's trying to scale back on that. But he still wants to keep a strong military. So the, the military is focused on different uh, jobs and changing the way we fight wars. So right now, uh, if, you, if you talk to recruiters, they're looking for drone pilots, you know, like the, the skills that they're looking for have changed. Um, they're looking for a lot of Navy guys because we, we feel like the next big battle might be a sea battle. So engineers, you know, guys who are good on ships, guys who are good solving problems with a, with a small amount of stuff. Um, so, the, so the skill sets are changing and they're looking at higher and higher, uh, more educated troops. You know, back in the day, like a lot of people, like you could choose, if you, especially like I said, if you were in trouble, you could always join the Army. It's not like that anymore. You have to pass ASVABs and physicals, and they look at your scores, and they decide which job you can qualify for, and if they're hiring for that job at the time. So yeah, so, so it's, it's competitive now to get into the branches. And like, like I said, Corey's thinking about it, so we're shopping around. Some of the branches are offering signing bonuses. Some of them are not. People have different term contracts, um, different opportunities, you know, whether you go active or reserve. Uh, the, the Ohio National Guard Scholarship Program is a great program that pays for school 100%. You know, you still only do your one weekend a month, two weeks in the summer. So that's what I try to push on a lot of kids is the guard scholarship. Um, so, so the recruiters right now are, are, are flush, and, and they have plenty of kids to pick from, and they can pick and choose who they, who they take. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's good and bad. I see it both ways. It's good because I feel like it's patriotic, and I like to see that people are still willing to serve. I hope they never bring the draft back, you know, because I don't want to see people compelled into service. I like a volunteer force. But on the other side, like I said, you only have that 1% that serves. And that's a very small percentage of the population. And so sometimes that can get skewed. You know, I was in with a lot of kids that had no other options. The military was the way they got out of like a poor urban situation or a poor rural situation was to join the military. You know, and, and sometimes that can throw things off. Just big picture. Is the yes. No, no, no. Recruitment's going well. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, I don't know. In Medina downtown, I think the Army, Marines, and Air Force. So the Marines, Navy, and Army all share a building in downtown Medina. Or not downtown, but uh, uh, I think it's on like Court Street. And they're, they're all in the same building. Like, they're doing so good. Like, they're all like buddies. You know, it's, <laughs> it's back in the day, they, they would not be that friendly to each other. But they're doing all right. The Air Force, I don't even know if there is an Air Force recruiter in Medina right now. Because they're doing so well, they don't even have people in every city. So yeah, the recruiters are, are doing fine. Yeah, they're, they're, they're getting enough people applying and they can, they can pick and choose who they want to take then. So it's very competitive. You have to test high on uh, what's the ASVAB, armed services, vocational, aptitude, battery, right. Um, you have to score high on that if you want to get in and get the job you want. Yeah, yeah. 
Any, any other questions? All right. Well, yeah, thanks a lot for coming out tonight. Thanks a lot for listening to tell me tell my stories. And for the guys that surf, thank you for your service. Yeah.